I can look. It's an article. I read the topic on the bullet points. It's called. I was a slap this weekend and didn't do what I was supposed to do. I had a good birthday. My daughter came home with her 12 lines of laundry. <laughs> so that's why I didn't get any work done. All right. So what we're going to talk about now is unintentional injury, motor vehicle crashes. One of the things that you'll start seeing in the literature is that car crashes, motor vehicles, whatever, uh, in the medical nursing literature will be called crashes instead of accidents. Okay? Because what they're saying, and I truly agree, is that a lot of these things can be avoided. If people follow the rules, uh, they avoid drunk driving, they avoid going too fast for conditions, they avoid going 110 miles an hour down the I-77. So, what you're going to see is that motor vehicle crashes is probably going to be the, the term that you're going to see now and in the future. Um, it's the leading cause of death in North Carolina. Basically, what you're going to see is that um, there's a significant cause of injury, uh, alcohol, lack of proper restraints, and speed are probably going to be your top three contributing factors to the injury and death that you see. Now, one of the things that you'll find is that lack of proper restraints. Even though North Carolina has that seatbelt law, still only 85% of people wear their seatbelts. So we're still going to have about 10 to 15 percent of people that are unrestrained, okay? And those are going to include children. It absolutely kills me to see some kid bouncing around in the back seat when you know that if that car has to stop suddenly, that kid's going to go flying right through that windshield. The other thing, of course, is the lack of proper restraints. One of the things that has just recently uh, been changed, it's not law yet, but I would imagine within the next couple of years it probably will be. Remember what they're saying is that infants rear-facing car seats in the back seat, okay? Um, they're now saying that even though you have older children, they prefer to have them rear-facing as well because the risk for injury is, is much, much less. Uh, definitely in the back seat uh, because of the airbags that we all see. Um, and those of us that have newer model cars that may have Takata airbags, um, Lord knows what's going to happen with those. Um, those of you that have been following the news have seen that those airbags sometimes deploy and send shards of glass or metal fragments. Um, and there has been another recall of airbags uh, for a different company. So one of the things you're going to see is that I would imagine that motor vehicle crashes will continue to be one of the leading causes of death. Um, typically what you're going to see, males, enough said, young children, teen drivers. Teen drivers are four times more likely than older adults to crash. And why is that? They don't have the experience, okay? One of the things that we've seen in North Carolina recently is that they now have that graduated licensing uh, where you really have to have your permit for at least a year uh, with no traffic violations before they will fully license. Uh, I think that that's a, a good idea. Of course, I'm not 16 years old right now and want my license. 
The other thing, of course, is that with North Carolina, we require that teen drivers only have other one other person in the car with them, uh, unless it's family members. Okay, so I think that that probably will help decrease the number of teen fatalities that we see. Um, one of the things that um, you may or may not be aware of is that um, God, what's the guy to speak? The drag racer. Yeah, it starts with an H. Anyway, his two sons were killed very close to my neighborhood because they were speeding. And um, the 16-year-old was driving and the 15-year-old was killed as well. And so he now has a defensive driving course for kids. Thank, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and it is phenomenal. Um, basically, he says that whenever you see kids come in there, they say, oh, I've had driver's ed, I've been driving for a while, I think I'm okay, you know, I think I'll nail this course. Well, the first time whenever they do a spin, uh, you see the, he says, you see the blood drain out of their face, and then they say, I think I need to listen and figure out what's going on with this course. Um, I'm thinking that increased access to courses like that will help with the kids. I mean, one of the things, what we see here in North Carolina, all right, we don't know how to drive in the rain or the snow, definitely not the ice, okay? So what you're going to see is that conditions are going to make a difference too. Now, with our older adults, okay, basically what you're going to see is that the crash rate per mile is equivalent to the of teen drivers. Well, they may have the experience of driving, but they have vision and cognitive changes that basically decrease their ability to react to situations so that they are similar to inexperienced drivers. One of the things, if you look at the statistics, you're going to see that elderly drivers tend to have more motor vehicle crashes at stop signs where they're making a left turn, okay? Because what happens is that you make that left turn, you look, you look, you look, and you don't see that car that's coming from that left-hand side. The other area where you see older adults have more motor vehicle crashes is um, on ramps to get on highways, okay? Uh, there was a significant crash on 77 near my exit um, Saturday night. I heard the helicopter go out twice. Um, so that, um, you know, those merging uh, areas, that's another thing that we in North Carolina don't know how to do is we don't know how to merge. Okay. A lot of times what happens instead of we just stop and, and that's not the way to do it. Okay. Um, the other thing of course you're going to see with your elderly drivers is they're more likely to die because of the comorbid problems that they've got going on. You've got diabetes that you've got to worry about. You've got COPD you've got to worry about. You've got heart disease you've got to worry about. So what you're going to see with multi-system trauma with these older adults is they're going to have a fairly significant mortality rate from their injuries, whereas a younger adult may be able to absorb those and go on. Okay? We talked a little bit about this. Um, Driving is a privilege and a responsibility. It's not a right. Um, basically, anyone that has had a DWI will find that out very quickly uh, because they will take away their license. Now, does that mean they're going to quit driving? No. But it means they're not going to drive legally. Other things, of course is that prevention efforts 
local fire departments, law enforcement, uh, local fire departments are great if you're talking about, do I have this car seat in the car correctly? You just drive by and they'll check it for you and tell you, no, you need this little clamp that goes on here and et cetera, et cetera. Um, elderly adults definitely need vision and ability screen. Okay. What vision do you have to have in North Carolina to drive? 20, 2040. Okay. And it has to be at least 2040 for you to be able to be licensed. Some people get around by that by memorizing the chart. Now, kinematics of injury, but simply when you're talking about kinematics, this is talking about the force, okay? It's one of those um, physics type thing. Um, what you're going to see is the extent of your injury is going to depend on the type and amount of energy force and it's going to depend on <clears throat> whether that person is restrained or not, okay? Um, Newton's first law of motion, a body at rest remains at rest, a body in motion remains in motion until they're acted on by an outside force, okay? And remember that outside force can be a trait, it can be a ditch, it can be another car. Okay. Basically, what happens is that the slower the energy that's applied, the less energy transference and degree of destruction is going to happen. So what I'm telling you is that if this car is going at 50 miles an hour and this car is going at 110 miles an hour, the force is going to be greater Okay, then if this car 50 miles an hour hits that tree that's standing still. Okay? So what you're gonna see is more damage. Now of course if they hit a concrete wall, that's not gonna give. That tree may bend and snap. So you might see that there is a less force. The, uh, the, remember, energy is never lost. It's always transferred. All right, so let's talk about with trauma deaths. There are three peaks. Basically, that's within minutes due to major neurological or vascular injury. Okay? Major neurological injury may be where you have that C1 through C4 spinal cord injury, and basically these people stop breathing. They will not breathe unless someone starts CPR. Other major neurological damage would be a severe head injury that may cause brain herniation. Now remember I told you herniation is a bad thing. Basically what you're going to do with that is with that brain injury, there's compression on that brain stem, and so they lose breathing and circulation. Their blood pressure is not supported. Now, vascular injury, that's going to be things like aortic disruption or major blood loss. The second peak, okay? is what we term the golden hour. That may be due to an cranial hematoma or major thoracic or abdominal injury. One of the major leaps in trauma care has occurred in this golden hour, okay? Because if you can get this person to a trauma center within that hour, Okay. We're not talking about Podunk Hospital in the middle of Anson County. We're talking about a CMC Maine, a Presbyterian Maine, a Duke, or UNC Hospitals. We're talking about 
someone that's used to trauma care, where they've got the surgeons immediately available to take care of this patient. We're seeing increased survivability for these types of injuries. Supposedly, Princess Di would have survived her injury if she had gotten to a trauma center. Uh, basically, what she had was an aortic disruptor. Uh, she ruptured ha- her aorta and basically bled out while they were trying to extricate her from the car. The third peak is going to be days to weeks after the injury, and typically that's due to sepsis and multi organ dysfunction syndrome. Okay? Basically, these people survive. <laughs> through that golden hour, but die from overwhelming sepsis. So it's like Ms. Rommel was saying, if you can recognize the early signs and symptoms of sepsis and treat it appropriately, more of these people are going to survive. Now, when you talk about frontal impact, meaning head-on collisions, or the car runs directly into some type of object. Typically, these are the types of injuries that you're going to see. Seatbelt should always be located at the pelvis. Remember, a lower than those hip bones. Especially if you have a pregnant woman, okay? Make sure that that seatbelt goes underneath that abdomen because if you have that seatbelt tighten very quickly, you can have abruptio, okay? Very quickly lose that fetus. You're going to look for abrasions or ecchymosis because a lot of times what you will find is that as that seatbelt tightens, you'll see that strap of where that seatbelt was. <clears throat> you worry about rupture or compression injury to the abdominal organs if it is not. Now, with an unrestrained driver, typically you're going to have an injury at the point of impact with the steering wheel. You're going to see chest trauma a lot of times. And where it is on the chest may be where that steering wheel is driven straight into their chest or where they hit that steering wheel as they're flying out the front windshield. Typically with frontal impact, this is what you're going to see. See spine trauma, traumatic brain injury, anterior flail chest. What do I mean by flail chest? Right, that's exactly right. With with flail chest, you have multiple rib fractures, typically more than one, one to th- more than two usually, where you're going to have an area as that <coughs> it breathes, you're going to have what we call paradoxical breathing. Okay, as the person breathes, typically what happens is the chest expands, well, that area where the flail chest in is actually going to sink in. And as the person takes that breath out or exhales, that chest at the area of the flail chest is going to go out. Okay? The rest of the chest sort of relaxes. It's going to pooch out a little bit. Okay? Why do I worry about flail chest? Injury to the lungs, like pneumothorax, meaning that those rib can actually poke or penetrate the lung tissue. It also is going to do what to my respiratory function, even if I don't have uh, damage to the lungs underneath. I'm going to have decreased breath sounds on that side because it's not going to adequately bring enough air in. Okay? 
other thing you would see, myocardial contusion, meaning the heart's bruised. Hearts don't like being messed with. So you may see um, all sorts of cardiac dysrhythmias, pneumothorax, traumatic aortic disruption, fractured spleen or liver, uh, posterior fracture dislocation of the hip, knee and or ankle injuries. Okay, Hip, knee, ankle injuries often occur because the steering column or even the dashboard are driven into the driver. Okay? And you can have either trapped or fractures because of that injury. These are just some examples. Oh. Look at the little dog. All right. One of the things that I'm going to tell you guys is that you can see this is where his seatbelt was. And it did his job. He may have a spinal injury, but the seatbelt kept him in that seat. One of the things you have to worry about is with those stra shoulder straps. I'm going to tell you, make sure it's far enough down so it is on your shoulder. Do not allow it to go on your neck because what we have started to see is carotid rupture. Because basically what happens is that, that as that seatbelt tightens, it causes that carotid to be compressed and typically that pressure it may be enough for rupture. Buckle up, no excuses, definitely is one of the things that you will see in my car. I had a 1974 Camaro when I first started driving. Hated this feature because you had to have your seatbelt on to start the car. The car wouldn't start without the seatbelt. And what you found is that if you put your purse on the driver's <laughs> side, you had to put the seatbelt on the purse if it weighed more than five pounds. Well, I ended up putting mine on the floor because I got tired of it. But the car would not start without that. Um, <coughs> animals need seatbelts too. Got my brother-in-law out of a ticket one time. Um, he had a um, basset hound and Blossom basically used to ride in the truck with him and um, she kept hit, you know, he put on the brakes, he rustled flies like a bat out of hell. But anyway, he put on the brakes and the dog would hit her head on the thing so he started strapping her in the seatbelt. Well, he got stopped for speeding. And the highway patrolman looked, saw this basset hound sitting there <laughs> like this. He said, you were going way too fast, but I'm not going to give you a ticket because this was my laugh for the day. <laughs> so he got out of his ticket. Now, side impacts. Basically what you're going to see is they're going to most, they receive most injuries on the same side of the body of impact. However, if you have unrestrained passengers or drivers, you may see damage to the other side of the body as well. What you're going to see with patients with side impact, cervical neck fracture or sprain, brachial plexus injury. Remember brachial plexus is a a large gathering of the nerves that control the arm. Typically what happens with brachial plexus avulsion or injury is somehow that arm gets jerked and it pulls or stretches those nerves. And typically what happens is that they get a numbness and inability to move that hand for a while. It may be permanent. Uh, lateral failed chest, pneumothorax, aortic disruption, diaphragmatic rupture may occur. Uh, fractured spleen, liver key, <coughs> fractured pelvis, fractured acetabulans. Okay. Now, with this fractured pelvis, you know, your mom 
always made you go to the bathroom before you got in the car? Okay. <clears throat> well, she was probably protecting your bladder. Well, number one, she didn't want to stop. And if it was Dad, you better hold it because I know he wasn't going to stop. <laughs> but one of the things that you will see if you have a full bladder with a fractured pelvis in a side impact, typically you're going to have a puncture of that bladder. So if the bladder is empty with that fracture of that pelvis, it's less likely to be punctured and less likely to have urine sort of floating out in your belly. So protect your bladder. Side impact, like I said, flail chest, brachial plexus, okay, and that's usually because of that head whipping and pulling on all of those nerves. Uh, fracture of the pelvis, you can here see this one is just separated, but a lot of times it will be uh, some shards. Bladder is going to sit right in here, guys. Okay. You may see uh, aortic disruption. Uh, I keep forgetting this one does not have um, a pointer. <coughs> but what you may see is with that aorta, uh, you may have an aneurysm, traumatic aneurysm form. Now, with rear impact, you may see cervical spine injury. Typically what you will see with low impact injuries, however, is soft in tissue injury to the neck. And here we're talking about whiplash. Okay, remember as I said before, that really is not a spinal injury. That is muscle injury. Okay? Now, rollovers, who knows? Especially if they were not restrained. It's very, very difficult to predict a pattern of injury with those patients. And you really are going to have to do a lot of good assessment to figure out what all is going on with those patients. Typically with unrestrained drivers, uh, you may see ejection. And with ejection from the car, the chance of severe injury or death increases more than 300%. Now, motorcycles. One of the things that you're going to see with motorcycle crashes is that you're going to have, instead of that nice card out there to absorb some of those injuries, most of the impact is going to be absorbed immediately by the driver or the rider. And those injuries are going to be substantially more severe. Uh, with a frontal impact, basically what you're going to see is that the front of the motorcycle, as they try to stop, is going to tip down and the driver may be propelled over the handlebars. Um, Typically, if there is a passenger, there's usually cap catapulted over the driver and fully ejected. Uh, be careful on Dale Earnhardt. I have seen this guy on a moped, and it looks like a three or four year old behind him um, that's hanging on for dear life. So just be careful out there because Lord knows you don't want to hit them. Um, Mopeds or, or DWI mobiles. Um, basically, what you see is that we're seeing more accidents from mopeds than we are from motorcycles because at least motorcycles can maintain what the set speed is on the highway. With mopeds, their top speed often is not what the uh, su suggested speed is. Um, 
typically with frontal impact, femurs, tibulus, fibs, uh, chest, abdominal injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and multiple C spine injuries. Uh, one of the things that we're that I saw whenever North Carolina enacted the helmet law um, is that we saw a decrease in traumatic brain injury. However, we saw an increase in C-spine injuries. Okay? Um, I don't know if you know, you know, South Carolina does not require a helmet. <coughs> um, California used to not. Um, Gary Busey used to be one of the most vocal anti-helmet law people until he experienced a head injury changed his tune, but I think it scrambled his brain before he... <laughs> the way he acts now is just... Yeah, it's just random. But I think a lot of that is put on because that that's sort of his persona now. Um, but you do see a d decrease in the amount of brain injury. With side impacts, typically what you're going to see are often compound or open fractures of the femur, tip, fib, and malleolus. Uh, if you have to lay down the motorcycle, meaning that it slides, uh, typically you're going to see the abrasions from asphalt and burns from the exhaust pipe. Uh, just an example, this is an elbow uh, that's got some lesions. Uh, what I would tell you is that if you do ride, make sure you wear appropriate clothing, long sleeves or a jacket, long pants, and boots. Um, this is just an example of an exhaust burn. Okay. Um, <laughs> my brother and I shared a motorcycle as children, and I was riding and one time hit a patch of sand rock and probably slid down 75 feet of sand rock on that motorcycle. And here I am driving home. <laughs> and my brother's yelling at me, Get off the motorcycle! You're bleeding all over it! <laughs> now, all I was, and I'm basically... From here all the way down, it was just sheared off with just the, the sand rock. But typically what you're going to see, road rash, uh, basically you're going to treat very similarly to what you're going to treat with burn. Uh, you're going to have to make sure that you remove the tissue that's non-viable. Um, and then you're going to do dressings very similar to what you're going to do with the burn dressings. Uh, to treat that. Okay, now with assessment. What you're going to see is that with these people that come into the emergency room, come into your ICU, or come into your general med surge unit, okay, most of these people, as I said, are sent to trauma centers. Uh, so if you're not working at a trauma center, more than likely you're not going to see them on your general med search unit. But if you are, they don't need ICU, or even if they do need ICU or ED, this is what you're going to do. The primary survey. Primary survey is airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. A, B, C, D, E. So what we're going to do with nursing assessment is our secondary survey, after we've taken care of all of the other, I'll go through it very fully in just a minute, is FGHI, full set of vital signs. We're going to look to family members, giving comfort to the patient and the family, head to toe assessment and medical history, and an inspection of the posterior services. So, let's talk about airway. It's always going to be our priority. We want to know what their O2 sat is. We want to know what their oxygenation is. We want to make sure that if some ABGs are drawn so that you can... 
make sure that their airway is protected. Now, with a lot of these multi-system trauma patients, typically what you're going to see is a class called coma of eight or less. Okay? Remember, with class called coma, what did I tell you that eight or less those people look like? They're unresponsive and comatose, so they're not able to protect their airway. So typically these people are going to be intubated with an endotracheal tube. Or if you're unable to get an endotracheal tube in, the physician is going to do an emergency tracheotomy. Now, if I have someone that has been intubated, what are some of the things that I'm going to do to check my tube placement, guys? CO2 detector is the gold standard. Okay, it used to be that you get chest X-ray, and that was the gold standard. But in tidal CO2 detectors, basically those stay in place on the tube while those patients are intubated. What else am I going to use to make sure that my tube is in the correct placement? Chest X-ray. What else? Listen. Listen. Okay. What I should be hearing is bilateral breath sounds. What if I only hear them on the right? This is the wrong place. The tube maybe have been advanced too far. Okay. So I get my respiratory therapist to reposition my tube. Well, what if that doesn't correct the problem? They may have what? Reduced Okay. So definitely, in tidal CO2, chest x-ray, and auscultation of lung sounds are going to be nursing priorities to make sure that that tube is in the correct place. The other thing is that I'm going to want to have that tube in place to protect my airway in case this patient vomits. Because the risk of aspiration is greatly increased if they cannot protect their airway. Because remember, what was one of the reasons that you see a lot of these motor vehicle crashes? Alcohol. Alcohol or drugs. Okay? And often what you will find is those may cause vomiting. So airway protection is basically one of the things that you're going to want to do. Treat all of those patients like they have C-spine until it's proven otherwise, which means that that collar that your um, EMS put on stays on until it's cleared. Alright, so that's what we're going to check for airway. For breathing, basically we're going to make sure that we get off their clothes. And typically what you're going to do is you're not going to unbutton them and just gently pull them off. Those things come off with a pair of scissors. All right, you cut them off. I'm sorry this is just your $250 leather coat. You shouldn't have been wearing it if you were drinking it in a car. <laughs> Because it's going in slower. Listen to breath sounds. Definitely, we're going to check for pneumothorax. We're going to actually palpate the chest and identify injuries that may impact in ventilation, like your flail flail chest. Look for bruising that may cause contusion. Remember, you can have either pulmonary contusion, meaning the lung is bruised, or you may have cardiac contusion. Okay. Tension pneumothorax. What are some of the signs and symptoms that I'm going to see when I'm doing my assessment of a tension pneumo? It's uh, Restlessness, okay. That's usually due to oxygen deprivation. Tachycardia, again, because of oxygen deprivation because the heart is trying to compensate for the decrease O2. 
You may see asymmetrical chest movement. There's one other sign that's a cardinal symptom that you'll see. <coughs> Tracheal deviation. <coughs> The other thing, of course, is decreased or absent breath sounds. Now, what's the difference between an hemothorax and a pneumothorax? Hemo is air, hemo is blood. Okay? Often what you will see is the hemothorax, if you've got rib cracks or fractures where that has been driven in. Hemothorax can also be seen with penetrating chest trauma too. Okay. Open pneumothorax. What is that? What do I mean by that? There's actually an opening so that you see bubbling. Okay. Whenever the patient tries to inspire. And you often not only do you see gas coming out, but what happens typically? Air goes in and it will cause that chest uh, lung to collapse because what happens is that the way the chest, the lung moves is this, there's that little layer of fluid in between the chest wall and the lung. And if air gets in there, what happens is that the contact with the lung is gone. So the chest wall will move, but the lung is no longer connected. Okay? What is our treatment whenever we notice as a part of our assessment there's a tracheal deviation, uh, tracheal deviation. Uh, there is absent or decreased breath sounds. What do we do? Well, that's what someone else other than the nurse is going to do, okay? Basically, our responsibility is saying, hey, this is what I see. And then, basically, they're going to treat it in some way. They may do a needle uh, aspiration to try to reinflate that chest tube, uh, chest wall, or they may put in an emergency chest tube, okay? Typically, with chest tubes, where is my tube going to be for air? Where is my tube going to be for blood if I've got a hemoneumothorax? Because I can have two chest tubes on the same side. The lower one is going to be which one? Blood. Okay? Because fluid usually doesn't flow uphill. Okay? Air rises to the top. So what you might see are two chest tubes. The upper one usually is for the hemothorax. For the pneumothorax, the lower one is for the hemothorax. Okay? All right, circulation. And then we'll take a break. Hemorrhage is the predominant cause of preventable death. Okay, you want to consider any hypotension to be hypovolemic until it's proven otherwise. Now, one of the things that you can sort of do is tell if you have a systolic blood pressure, if you can't hear blood pressure, if you have a systolic blood pressure of greater than 90, you will have a radial pulse. If you can feel a radial pulse, you know their BP is systolic is at least 90. But if I don't feel a radial pulse, but I can feel a carotid or femoral, I know my systolic blood pressure is at least 60. Both of them are systolic. I'm not worried about diastolic. 
because they probably are not in the past. So yeah, if your systolic blood pressure is great, nine year greater, you will have a radial pulse. If you have a systolic blood pressure of 60 or greater, you will have a carotid or femoral pulse. So if you can feel a carotid pulse, but you can't feel a radial, <coughs> you know your systolic is at least 60, but it's not 90, okay? Now, what did I tell you about neurogenic shock? You will have a mild hypotension, okay? All right? And you will have bradycardia. With hypovolemic shock, what are you going to say? You're going to see, you may see severe hypertension, right? But what's your heart rate going to do? It's going to go up, okay? So what I would do is rule out hypertension due to hypovolemia before I worry about neurogenic shock with someone that's multiple multi-system trauma. Your hypertension is going to be lower. You're going to have a tachycardic patient. But think about it. You're going to treat them very similarly anyway, right? You're going to give them both fluids. Okay? So if it is due to neurogenic shock, you give them a fluid bolus, their blood pressure is going to come up. If it's due to hypovolemic shock, you're going to give them probably a lot more fluids and their blood pressure may come up. The difference between the two is that you're probably going to have to transfuse this person. You don't have to transfuse someone with neurogenic shock. The fluid will take care of them. Depending on the amount of blood loss, it will depend on how much they have to be transfused. Now, whenever you have a large volume blood loss due to trauma, where they don't respond to crystalloids of two liters, I would probably assume that they're going to get a blood transfusion. Uh, one of the things that you will see is that with your multi-system trauma patients, there's usually not time for a type of loss. So what they're going to do is transfuse O negative blood. And they're going to uh, probably put in on what we call a rapid transfuser. And in that case, you can get that blood product in one to two minutes. That whole 250 cc's in one to two minutes. That's very fast. And sometimes you will see that there will be three or four units being pumped at the same time. Um, massive transfusion, remember, is considered um, a replacement of the total blood volume in less than 24 hours um, or administration of more than half of the patient's estimated blood volume in an hour. What is our blood volume? Five to seven liters. Okay. <coughs> Complications that you're going to see because of those hemorrhages, thrombocytopenia. <coughs> Typically, what you're going to see is that that should be stored blood platelet function in stored blood. Basically, platelets don't live, remember, but 7 to 10 days. A lot of these units of red blood cells are stored up to 30 days. So platelets actually can be gone. So thrombocytopenia can be a problem. Uh, 
basically you're going to have coagulation factor depletion. Remember, with a lot of these people with massive hemorrhage, DIC can be a problem because they use up all their clotting factors. Hypocalcemia can be a problem because remember I told you that that preservative in blood, calcium citrate, and it will bind the calcium in their blood and that you may see hypocalcemia because of that. You may see hyperkalemia. Why? Well, because of the trauma. What else? Low blood volume because I am rapidly infusing. Okay? When you put it on a rapid infuser, basically it's a pressure bag and you're squeezing that blood in. So typically you will see some elevation in potassium because some of those cells will be lysed as they go through. Typically, you will see patients that will be hypothermic as well. Because of blood loss, the addition of crystalloid fluids, and then the blood going in. If they tell you to warm the blood, do not put it in the microwave. <laughs>
exposure or environmental control. This is where we want to get them completely undressed. This is where that $280 leather coat's coming off with my pair of scissors. This is where everything comes off with that pair of scissors. Remembering if it is trauma due to gunshot wound or stab wound or whatever, we definitely want to cut away from the evidence and keep that intact for the legal system to deal with. Okay? Well, just as an FYI, if I am cutting off someone's bloody shirt because of a gunshot wound, do I put it in a paper bag or a plastic bag? Paper bag. Because typically what you're going to see is that the plastic will hold that moisture in and cause disintegration of the evidence. Paper bag. And typically what you're going to see is I usually keep all that stuff until someone says this is not either a medical examiner's case or this is not a legal case. And then I typically ask the family if they want it before I throw it away. Usually most family members don't, but you want to definitely um, ask. When I get these people completely undressed, one of the environmental things that I'm going to worry about is cover them with warm blankets to make sure that I am not chilling them with hypothermia. But I want them completely undressed so that I can see what the extent of their injuries are. And part of that is going to be with my secondary survey. The other thing, of course, that I'm going to do environmental is I want to know when the last time this person had a tetanus shot. Because tetanus toxoid prophylaxis is imperative. Especially motorcycle, whenever you're talking about contact with dirt, asphalt, whatever. Uh, penetrating injury of some sort. Definitely we're going to cover them. Typically what you're going to see is that <clears throat> with major trauma, I don't care with, if you're within your 10 years, they're going to give you tetanus. Okay? Um, most of the time, even within five years. <laughs> the secondary survey, of course, is after resuscitative measures with an adequate patient response. During this time, that head-to-toe evaluation is performed in five to ten minutes. You don't have the time to do textbook head-to-toe assessment like we tested you on in 11. Okay? We're talking a five to ten, get it done, head-to-toe assessment. That doesn't mean that you skip things, but you've got to learn how to do it very, very quickly. Okay, some of the signs that you may see during this head-to-toe assessment that you're going to be very, very uh, careful about. What is this one, guys? Raccoon eyes, indicative of basal skull fracture. Again, battle sign, basal skull fracture. What about this one? Collins. Collins. Okay. Not twilight colons, but <laughs> what does that mean? Abdominal bleeding. Okay, am I going to see this immediately? Yeah, usually 24 to 48 hours. If I see it immediately, I know that they've probably been bleeding before, and that might have been what caused them to pass out and have the accident. What about this one? This is hip, belly button right here. Well, but what does that indicate? Blood trauma. Huh? Blood trauma? Okay, this is called Turner's sign. T-U-R-N-E-R-S. Basically, Turner's sign is retroperitoneal hemorrhage of some sort. It can be due to blood trauma. 
it can also be seen whenever you've had a patient that has had like a kidney biopsy or needle biopsy of an organ. <coughs> and what that indicates, again, is retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Okay? You may see it talked about as Gray, G-R-E-Y, Turner's syndrome, sign, but most of the time it's just Turner's. <coughs> Dr. Gray was also described. Now, with our secondary survey, one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that we're looking in that head-to-toe assessment, looking at the head and face, palpate the scalp for lacerations, dispressed skull fractures, battle sign, facial fractures. Okay? One of the things that you're going to see is that if you have someone that has scalp lacerations, it's going to bleed like crazy. One of the things that's really sort of about the skull or the scalp is that it does not have the ability to vasoconstrict. With an adult, scalp lacerations do not cause blood loss significant enough to drop their blood pressure. It just looks bad. But I'm going to tell you with infants and children, because of their lower blood volume, they can have enough loss in order to cause hypovolemia. So with children and infants, scalp lacerations can cause a significant blood loss because of the proportion of blood and their lower blood volume. Eyes and ears, definitely we're going to look for that raccoon eyes or eye injury, remove their contact lenses. One of the things you don't want is for this patient to be in ICU for five or six days with <coughs> contact lenses in. Not removing those contact lenses can cause the lens to adhere to the eye and basically cause significant corneal damage whenever it's removed. We're going to look for the ears for CSF leak, for the nose for CSF leak. With the mouth, loose or broken teeth. We're going to look for tone lacerations or hematoma. Typically what you're going to find is that you're going to remove any dentures. Remember those teeth? <clears throat> if they're loose enough, they can get lost and be aspirated. We hope they're swallowed. But if they're jagged enough, that may cause some problems with them. Uh, bowel perforation. Okay. C-spine. Um, one of the points that I've got there for patients uh, above the age of 65, you're going to make sure you evaluate C2. Remember I told you that C2 is that odontoid process for the Hankins fracture. Okay. Especially in those patients, I would evaluate that. Pretty much they evaluate it in everyone. Um, with your chest, evaluate for subcutaneous emphysema, which is going to be what? What is it also called? Not atelectasis, but you may hear it's called crepitus. Remember, subcutaneous emphysema is the release of air under the skin. It may be caused by pneumothorax. And typically what you see is that it feels like Rice Krispies under the skin. Snap, crap, and pop. <coughs> the larger the area of subcute emphysema, typically it corresponds with the size of the pneumothorax. Excellent. 
with your abdomen, palpate for tenderness, look for that colon sign. Um, used to be what we would do to check for blood in the belly is actually in, poke a hole in, infuse fluid, and then pull it out. Uh, peritoneal lavage. Uh, what they found is that even though that was a very quick way, uh, technique sometimes was lacking. So people that did not have abdominal hemorrhage uh, sometimes developed it. Uh, now what they do is ultrasound. That fast uh, ultrasound. And it gives you a good, good idea of whether there is abdominal hemorrhage or rupture of a spleen or a rupture of a liver, which is one of the things that you can have major hemorrhage from a splenic rupture or a liver rupture. With the pelvis, okay, remember I talked about bladder rupture with your pelvic fractures. The other that you may see is, of course, um, retroperitoneal hemorrhage with your <coughs> fractures of the pelvis. Uh, typically what you will see with pelvic fractures, uh, you can't cast it. So the majority of the time what you will find is that those patients will be on bed rest as that pelvic fracture heals. If it's an unstable fracture. With doing the survey of the genitalia, uh, one of our risks is always going to be, is this patient pregnant? Um, one of the things you want to do is quickly ascertain if they are pregnant, what damage has occurred to the fetus, if any. Usually what you will find, unless there's blunt abdominal trauma, the fetus usually does pretty well if mom's blood pressure has been maintained because it's pretty insulated in that amniotic fluid and it just sort of bounces around. Of course, the larger the fetus, the more uh, chance there is for injury because there's not as much fluid that helps them to uh, be protected. A couple of things. Typically what we're going to do with this critically injured multi-trauma patient is put in a Foley catheter. The only caveat with that is that if you have bleeding from the urethra, it's not your responsibility. I wouldn't want a urologist to do that. We're going to look for extremities, tenderness, crepitus, limited joint movement. Definitely going to do pulse checks on all of the pulse points. Okay? So that's your head to toe. These are your nursing diagnoses. <coughs> Ineffective airway clearance is always going to be a priority, guys. Risk for infection, impaired physical mobility, spiritual distress, and post-trauma syndrome. A lot of times what you find is these patients will develop <coughs> PTSD. We want to make sure that we maintain their airway, oxygen saturation, monitoring our level of consciousness. Again, treat everybody like they have a C-spine injury until it's proven otherwise. Long term, we're going to make sure that these people turn off deep breathe and continue that pulmonary toilet throughout their injury. Risk for infection. Standard precautions with everyone. Those of you that will get a chance to work in the ED will see when they've got a multi-trauma coming in, everyone gowns, gloves, masks, Eye protection, the whole nine yards. You're going to monitor the wounds for odor, redness, heat, swelling, okay, because we're looking for infection. Um, 
basically one of the things that you will see is if they develop what we call gas gangrene, um, fever, pain, swelling, odor, that's a very, very foul odor. Um, it smells like rotting meat, because that's exactly what it is. Okay. Remember, we want to prevent sepsis, because that is one of the things that you're going to see that's going to cause death in a lot of these patients. Impaired physical mobility. Active or passive range of motion, if it's indicated. And you're going to do that at least every eight hours. If they're in a position where they can cough, turn, and deep breathe every two, you're going to do that. If not, then you're going to put them on one of these beds that's going to do it for them. Okay? I'm going to talk about those more in a minute. Incentive spirometry. And we're going to make sure that we monitor for signs of DVT. Now, these are some of those beds that I was telling you about. This is a rotor rest delta bed. Basically what happens is that the patient, you can see where their legs go, right here. Head goes up here. Basically what happens is that you can, there's their position in the bed like this. And you can tell this bed to turn 45 degrees, 35 degrees, up to 90 degrees so that they're sort of straight up and down looking straight out. Okay? What you will find is that it will give them a gentle turn depending on what you set it for. What this does is that it eliminates the need to turn and position these people for every two hours. It's good for pulmonary toilet or hygiene because it helps the lungs to stay free and clear and decreases atelectasis. The other thing is that it helps with pressure areas. Okay, One of the things that you're going to see when a lot of these patients come in is they're going to be on a backboard. If these, as soon as these people are stable and spinal cord injury has been ruled out, get them off of that backboard because I've seen patients on them for eight hours and they have horrible breakdown. So you want to get them off of that hard backboard as soon as medically possible. Now, this is what I call the prayer beds, guys. Okay, because you don't turn your patient basically to inspect and do your auscultation of your lungs or to clean them up when they've had a stool or do anything else, what you're going to do is turn that bed at a position and you're going to go in here, under here like a car mechanic changing the oil. <coughs> pull out, open the hatch, pull out the support and look and see what you can do what you need to do, whether it's wound or whether it's cleaning or whether it's auscultation. What you have to be very careful about is you can only have one hatch open at a time because you don't want your patient to fall out. Okay, So you definitely want your patient to fall out. Like I said, a lot of times you're on your knees or looking up and you hope they don't poop on you. These are the newer kinds of beds. I think I've seen a few of these over at CMC Northeast uh, where they actually will come to a sitting position uh, so that you don't have to get them out of bed to have them sitting up. Um, a lot of these have those uh, airflow mattresses, which um, sort of like the medical version of the Tempur-Pedic Okay, where you can make it either firmer or softer depending on your patient's needs. There are all sorts of other beds out there. These are the two that come to mind. Typically you would use the rotor rest if you've got someone with spinal cord injury that could not be turned or log rolled like with a, a thoracic or lumbar um, or a lot of your multi-trauma patients cannot tolerate the turn. So you 
um, spiritual distress. Remember, a lot of these motor vehicle crashes or multiple traumas happen very suddenly. And a lot of times you do not, families do not have the ability to prepare themselves for that. Um, typically what you will find is that uh, families are in crisis um, and need to be dealt with very compassionately as well as you know you never say well it'll be all right because you know it might not um, one of the things that we see especially with patients with multi-system trauma is that uh, they're fairly young a lot of times they're fairly healthy and they are the best candidates for organ donation especially if they've had a very significant head trauma. One of the things you want to be very careful about is that we, if, if they are going to be declared brain dead, okay, meaning that there's no cerebral blood flow, no cerebral function, no brain stem function, you want that information being to be given to that patient's family prior to asking them for organ donation. You don't want to say, can we have their organs and, oh, by the way, they're dead. You never do it like that. Typically what you're going to see is that um, the organ donation, there will be a coordinator, uh, and that coordinator often uh, will come and assist the physician. Life Share in the Carolinas uh, is the one that we see in this area uh, that will come and assist the physician. Because not only do you have to worry about giving the family the information that they need, but to, in order for those organs to be viable, Typically, one of the things that they're going to have to do is go through a fairly rigorous screening process. Uh, what you're going to find is that there are some contraindications for donations. Um, anyone that has uncontrolled sepsis, anyone that has an acute viral infection, anyone that's HIV positive, and any malignancy with the exception of a primary intracranial tumor. Okay? Remember, primary intracranial tumors never metastasize. So that would not be a contraindication. Um, with organ donation, what you're going to see is that um, if they are approached, uh, it's much better if the family knows that this person was an organ donor. Typically what you will find is the living will. Um, one of the things that you can find out if they were an organ donor or not is on your driver's license. That's why they ask at the driver's license office. So we can quickly look. Um, what you will find is that if this person is declared brain dead and they are taken off life support or ventilatory support and pressure support, like Ms. Rommel was talking with your vasopressive or vasoactive drugs. 62% um, of them basically will have cardiac arrest within 24 hours, and about 87 will go in about 72 hours. Um, basically, 30 to 50% of families that are asked to donate organs do refuse. Okay. Um, and what you find is that that may be um, that even though it's designated that you are a donor on your driver's license, unless there is health care power of attorney that says that you have to follow my wishes, they still have the ability to refuse. Okay. Um, basically, in Norway, it's considered everyone's considered a door, uh, an organ donor. So everyone basically donates over there. Um, 
what I will tell you is that a lot of times with these patients that are being declared brain dead, they are candidates for organ donation, they are kept on the ventilator and the vasoactive drugs until the organ transplant team can line up the potential recipients of those organs and until the uh, harvest team can get into place. Okay, so it may be, once that patient has been declared brain dead, it may be up to an additional 24 hours before they're taken to the OR for organ harvest. Uh, typically what you will see and what you tell families is that uh, after they are taken to the OR, uh, then whenever they're taken off, Organ, organs are harvested, they will remove the pressure support and the ventilator in the OR. So typically what I tell families is that you know you need to say your last goodbyes now because they often will not see them again. Um, that is one statistic that does not go on the OR's death rate because that is basically they've already been declared dead. Questions about donation? All right. Post-traumatic syndrome. Remember, it is a crisis. A lot of patients, as well as their family, especially if it was witnessed, developed post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, you want to make sure that you refer the patients as appropriate to either counseling or psychotherapy. Um, and a lot of times what you're going to find is that with these patients, not only do they have multi-system involvement, but their rehab, uh, their care is going to be very, very involved uh, for at least a couple of years after their accident or crash or whatever. Um, so you want to make sure that they're tuned in to the community services that they need. Um, if they do not have at-home care, um, then you might, they may be looking at long-term care placement. Uh, just as an FYI, um, if this patient we had a patient with a C12 fracture, um, of course, ventilator dependent. Um, there are, I would say, less than 20 ventilator beds in the entire state of North Carolina. Um, so that if you're looking at home care for a ventilator, um, you're not looking at 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week care from a home health care agency. Basically, what you'll find is that Medicaid will only pay for six to eight hours of nursing care a day. So that means that family members have to be responsible for the other 16 to 20 hours of care for that patient. So what you're talking about is a lot of family support, tuning them into a lot of community resources. Um, just as an FYI, I forgot to mention when we were talking about C12, uh, they do make a uh, diaphragmatic nerve stimulator, and it's really sort of cool because what happens is that it stimulates the diaphragm so that there's chest movement but you can only stimulate one side of the diaphragm at a time. Uh, you have to turn on the left side for eight hours, then you turn on the right side for eight hours, and then at night they have to go on a ventilator to breathe. Because if you burn out the diaphragmatic nerve, then you have nothing other than a ventilator support. Questions about multi-system, 